right, so it is Wednesday, July 19th, 2017, and this is our weekly eh, coaching call, teleseminar about all things I Awake, soon to be a podcast. So that'll really be cool. And we've been having great fun with the Journey of Integral Recovery podcast, and we're going to interview Robert Augustus Masters uh, this weekend or Saturday. Today's Wednesday. And Robert is just wonderful. Uh, I've, I've done some interviews and work with him before, and he is a, I don't know, he's just a wonderful, deep man, you know. And uh, one of his, um, I guess, great pieces of wisdom is, is um, what is the phrase he uses? Avoiding the shadow, a bypassing. Uh, spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing. Oh, yeah. my God. It's so key. And he wrote a whole book about that. And that's just, that, that became, uh, well, it's what I was experiencing in my, my initial uh, kind of opening with this technology and then uh, the, the, uh, the releasing that happened seriously, intensely for nine months. It still happened, but, and it was that, that I, that I understood that intuitively that by not avoiding the shadow and, and experiencing less stuff processed in my body, I thought I was inventing all this myself. I wasn't. Um, which just goes to show there's a, there's a wisdom thing in all of us that we tap into. And then you go, oh, this is how, you know, the ancient ones figured this out. There's some kind of, you know, Akashic record or there's some kind of collective wisdom that we seem to, to kick into. And then anyway, so then I, I started reading his work later on. And um, I was just, yeah, I was blown away by it. And the spiritual body was really, and, and of course, not only is, is he a, a great writer, but he's also a great uh, guide and therapist and a man of great wisdom and uh, wrote a book on being a man recently, really good men, men's book. And there's not that many good men's book. If you go to a Barnes and Noble or something, you go to the women's section, there's tons of good books on femininity and women. And you go to the men of like two or three volumes, maybe, you know, and I don't know how many of that good, but there have been several classics uh, since I've been looking at that literature. And it's important, you know, for men to know what it means to be a man and, and a, you know, in a positive, healthy way. And, uh, and it's complicated, like all things human, right? Because we're complicated creatures and we, we, you know, we, we function and live in many domains. So hi everybody. Anyway, I think today the, the question that was posed to me was uh, how do we get, and if you have questions, you'll let us know. And this is really good for, for, for shows in the future is how do we get rid of negative stories? Hmm. How do we get rid of the negative stories that we have either uh, personal stories that somehow we just created because of our parents, because of our upbringing, because of our culture, because of the zeitgeist, because of bad things that happened to us and how we interpreted them. You know, if you live in a less than functional family, which apparently most of us do, okay? And uh, you know, what is a, what, first of all, what's the defini definition of a functional family? I used to ask, and the answer that came out was a functional family is a family when each member is really loved and supported to become uh, their deepest, best versions of themselves. Like, oh. So did you feel you had that when you were growing? I don't wanna get too personal, Doug, but. Um, I mean, know. there, there were strengths and challenges there, of course, as with any family. I mean, even even yeah. with the bad stuff, you know, I never I never felt unloved or anything like that. But there was certainly some dysfunction there too. So. Yeah, you know, and I had basically pretty good parents, and I was like always like uh, trying to figure out, you know, why was I so miserable? Why did I dislike myself so much? And it turned out that well, when you learn the enneagram, which we've talked about, and we'll continue to unpack, we're going to have Leslie Hersberger. A dear friend and colleague, and one of the world experts on the Enneagram here, oh, on on, on the uh, the other podcast. I kind of get these things mixed up because it's all the same thing to me. Um, that not only do you have your point, which I'm a counterphobic six, is you have your parents' points that you're kind of filtered through. My dad was a one, and my mom's a three. And the, if you know the Enneagram, the ones that judge, the perfectionist. And he was really a co pretty kind man most of the time. Okay, but there was a lot of his unconscious agenda that I picked up. And so I was never good enough, though he never told me that. But it was just kind of that thing. I got that one thing going on. I never quite be good enough. And then my mom, you know, she's just a the energizer bunny. This woman had energy to do stuff. And so I was like, God, I'm not good enough. I can never do enough. 
I really suck. I'm not sure why, you know? And uh, I would listen to all the horrible stories that a lot of people had about what they're growing up and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, I was going, wow, why am I so messed up? I, you know, if I'd had their background, I'd be three times as bad. But then again, life is faithful. And as I grew into my 30s, life began, you know, crunching me and breaking me. And uh, there's a verse that Jesus says in, the, in, in the, uh, one of the uh, synoptic gospels. He says, if the, if the stone falls on, if you fall on the stone, you, it'll break you. But if the stone falls on you, it'll grind you to dust. In other words, he says, just be open to being broken. Don't resist it. Either way, you're going to be broken, but there's a difference of just being broken and yielding and, and, and being part of it than resisting it where you just get ground into dust. All, all can be, you know, constructive and helpful, but I feel that uh, I got ground into dust because I probably needed that. And, uh, you know, but by the grace of the universe, I'm here and rocking today. So we, we talk, so we're talking about these negative stories and how they can uh, become, you know, come from childhood things, unconscious things. Uh, I think the side guys, you know, I was a child of the 60s, kind of a late bloomer in the 60s. I started coming, coming into my own in that world around 1970 and, you know, in 72. And they say that the 60s ended in 75 when the Vietnam War, we were finally out of that. So it really continued for, you know, not just the 60s, but maybe from from 64, 63 into 75, that era. And so I was, I'm sure that shaped um, my stories and whatnot. And uh, then you get, you know, you get rejected in love or, you know, you fail in school. I mean, we all, you know, we all have these things uh, which are can be our greatest teachers, but we develop these stories. And a lot of times we're, we're kind of unaware of these stories. You know, it's just kind of, there's just not that much mindfulness about our inner dialogues and what we tell ourselves. So one of the things in meditation, as you begin to increase mindfulness and uh, not just stopping thinking, which is a nice thing to do, right? When you get that, those places in, uh, uh, in meditation where the mind just turns off, if you're a beginner at that stuff, you can kind of freak out and go, oh my God, my mind stopped, you know, where, oh, and you start thinking about it, you know, where am I? You know, if that's gone, if the Zen thing, the body mind drop happens, where well, your mind is gone and your body, you're no longer aware of that, then, oh, am I lost in perdition, you know, lost forever in the void or is it, oh, or just like, this is kind of cool. You know, the first time I ever went scuba diving, they put tanks on me. And I didn't have any certification. I was a little kid. I must have been eight or nine years old. And they threw me in a river in Texas. And uh, I went down and I started panicking, you know, because it's, oh, God, I'm going to drown. <sighs> and I couldn't quite get up because it was too heavy for me. Then I just said, okay, I'm breathing, I'm breathing, I'm breathing, not drowning, breathing. It's like, oh, kind of cool down here. So sometimes in, you know, meditation, it can, the, the dropping away the ego, which is a very desirable thing. So it kind of, uh, you figure out, oh, there's something much greater than me that's connected to all this, and it's not my ego. Ego's part of that, but right now that's turned off. You don't, you don't freak out. You start to accept it, and you learn, and you learn to learn to uh, deal with those states to, to keep growing. So anyway, back to the back to the negative story. So when you begin to meditate, you begin to become aware of your thoughts and feelings, and and this interior mindfulness. You know, not just my hands are on the chair. You know, just I in the breath of my nose or whatever the sounds, you know, the ocean outside the window, whatever it might be, or the traffic, you become aware of your interior states. And then you start, you know, you might start feeling some, you know, the, the emotions come up, you know, that, that are brought on by the feelings, you know, like self-loathing. It feels sad. You feel ugh, sick, bad. And, and the thoughts you start becoming aware of the thoughts, you know, you really are not the person that you were born to be, you know, your parents' expectations, or you really come from the whacked out family, you'll never amount to anything, or you're not smart enough, or you're not this enough or that enough, you know, you're ugly, you're overweight, you're, uh, you know, all our stuff. And it's just like, oh my goodness, what a, what a story. And, and then you have to kind of, the one, the way I, one of the ways I've learned to work with it is you bracket all the thoughts, because if you just keep entertaining the thoughts, but you're aware of them, it's like, oh, that's why I feel bad about myself. So let's just kind of bracket the thoughts and stay with the feelings of uh, self-loathing, let's say in this case. And, you know, you might feel kind of nauseous or your heart's hurting. Uh, usually most of my work is done right around here, these chakras uh, from, from the belly up to the heart, maybe the throat, but more frequently the heart, but sometimes lower than that. And you just stay with the feelings. And I, I have this thing about when, when negative feelings or uh, sensations start coming up, or even good ones, you know, uh, just say thank you, teacher, you know, for, for showing up. 
and help me to be here and be present, you know, and, and if it's really painful, of course the mind will want to go this and that and you keep coming back and, you know, and if you're like stayed with it 80% of the time, it's pretty good. You know, that's a good bit of discipline. So then you, you process the feelings or the emotions on a somatic, a uh, subtle uh, and physical body level. And then, you know, kind of where the, and then the, the stories begin to lose their charge, you know, just like PTSD, you know, initially when these bad things happen and I've experienced this myself and when, when the memories come back, you just, you know, you're shaken and, and, and the fear and, and the body chemistry coming, you know, and it's like, you're right there re-experiencing. It's really painful. But after you kind of become aware of the story and then you become, then you just allow the, the charge, the somatic subtle body energy sensations to do their thing that releases energy. Okay. Cause the stuff is stuck somehow in the soma. And then the, the stories just become, okay, well, yeah, that really does kind of suck. So let's see if we can come up, you know, and you can, you're can. you not just mentally doing this, but you're kind of talking to your wisdom self, your deeper self that we begin to get in touch with in interior practice. And, you know, what, what's a better, you know, more, more truthful, you know, maybe not the ultimate truthful, but at least a step up, you know, an upgrade from what I was doing before a story about myself, you know, that, that gets me fully grounded in, you know, who I am, and at the deepest level, who I am at, at a kind of a soul level, who I am at an ego level, and what I'm here to do. And, you know, what are my strengths? You know, what do I have to, you know, bring to this? And, you know, John is a brave guy, da 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 tenacious guy who's working on this in order to achieve this to help his people. You know, something like that. And, um, okay. And so, thank you. That, that comes a better story, and that becomes kind of rooted in your present state of development. And of course, these these stories, just like your uh, your your uh, your bios or your um, um, uh, your resume is keep getting updated, right? You know, as as life goes on and you have new chapters and whatnot. So, um, yeah, that that is uh, uh, a good way to deal with that. And, and first becoming conscious of it, becoming conscious of the effects of the stories. You know, if it's really good, optimal story, I mean, you know, you have to fix it. It's fine. I, I've never met too many of us are like that, but it's a possibility. Or if you've already done a bunch of work on yourself. And then you, you kind of take the sting and the, the emotional charge to hurt and to make you depressed and to, to, you know, to control you consciously and unconsciously by just being really present with the feelings as they come up. So let me tell you a little story, a little thing that happened to me the other day, and I'm really still kind of buzzing from this. It was a very powerful experience. Now, as some of you might have heard in the past, I'm really passionate about playing tennis. I freaking love tennis, okay? I'm a student of the game. i work at my swings, you know, I study forehands, backhand serves, all this stuff. I know the areas I need to grow in and I'm constantly looking at the the masters and kind of borrowing from them, just like my guitar playing, same sort of thing. So, but I, I noticed for, for a few weeks, it's like I've always been very extremely competitive, but I started to get competitive to the, just to the, just to, oh my God, John, stop this crap. And I was watching uh, the men's finals Wimbledon the other day, and uh, it was Roger Federer and a, and a Croatian Selic, I forget his last name, but about uh, into the second second set, Selic just started melting down. He was having a, he was having an emotional breakdown because you know here was Roger Federer, the greatest player ever, cleaning his clock on the biggest stage in in professional tennis, something he'd driven for his whole life. He already won a Grand Slam. He's a good player, but he was just not. He was just, his game was falling apart and he just started falling apart. And I was looking at it and I go, wow, that reminds me of me on the court. And I said, I just, I mean, I don't break down, but I just have a terrible attitude. I get mad. I'm losing. I get depressed and sulky. It's awful. You know, I come out of it pretty quickly, but it's just like, I'm going to look, if I can't figure out a better way to play this game, I just don't want to do it anymore as much as I love the game. So last time I went and played, I went, I said, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make this a prayer. Okay. This is going to be yoga. And I'm, I'm just going to be in touch with God while I do this thing. And, you know, we talk about the three ways of dealing with the divine is first person where you just become it, you know, their non-dual reality. Second person where you're talking to God. And third person where you're talking about God, theology, what we know about God. God isn't real. This, that. It's all third person perspective. Well, anyway, I was saying on the second person, which I'm pretty comfortable with. And so, you know, and I get ready to do the serve. 
And it's sort of like, you know, the most difficult, probably key thing you can do in tennis. And I was just like, God, let it fly. This is a prayer. And I, you know, I, I'd hit the ball and whether it hit the net or go in or out, I was just doing it with gratitude and giving it up to higher power. And I started going from second to first person. And when Pam would, Pam's a really good player. And when she would do things, I would just say, that's great, honey. And I did that sometime before, but begrudgingly, but truly being happy that she was playing so well and my game, and I didn't curse, you know, I could be I have a terrible potty mouth on the court, terrible kids around. I just have to, you know, and I, I didn't do the, you know, the McEnroe, the Nastasi thing and all this stuff. I just stayed in the game and stayed very present. And I played much better. Actually won. And uh, I came away feeling like a really holy experience. And I was like, okay, you know, can I, uh, can I take this change of behavior in this part and let it, you know, let it flow into the rest of my life. And, and it's really been cool. So there, I haven't played since then, but I, I can't wait to go back and to try, you know, doing this as not as a competitive uber masculine, whatever the thing is, but doing it a, as much more of a spiritual practice at the same time, you know, letting the energy come through me to, to play and be the best, uh, version excellence arete I think they said or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right but in ancient Greeks they had a word for 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 excellence that that included I think the spiritual and the physical so to to, to do it in that way and I, I've discovered that in music you know but now taking into this other practice that I really like so that's a way uh, of dealing with the the kind of negative stories that we can you know, bring from childhood or from these, all these other sources, our culture, whatever it might be, uh, PTSD, injuries, things that happen to us, work with them, take the charge out of them. And sometimes that takes a long time. You can't just release it all in one thing. You have to sit with it and work with it. It's, it's, it's an ongoing process. And then you can just find areas in your life. I think, uh, uh, reinforced by the, the mindfulness and the interiority of, you know, doing daily practice with the stuff that we do and change your attitude and see if it doesn't come out in a way that's much more life enhancing and more beautiful and not just so annoyingly childishly stupid <laughs> to put it bluntly. So, I'll, so Doug, you have anything you want to follow up on with that? Yeah. Yeah. There are a whole bunch of things that came up for me, John, while you were sharing all that. Um, I think this is a really powerful conversation and something that's so important. We're just bombarded with these messages these days, it's all over our culture. You know, we're exposed to more media, more, more information in the course of a day than our ancestors dealt with in a lifetime. And so much of it is negative messaging too, because they want us to feel like we're not good enough. We're not okay as we are so that we, you know, we'll, we'll buy the makeup or the clothes or whatever thing we need. I don't mean to be on an anti-consumerist rant because I don't have a problem with you know, capitalism as such when we use it for positive purposes. But some of this messaging is incredibly damaging. Um, I took the weekend away for a much needed uh, getaway with my wife, went and stayed at a bed and breakfast and had no technology and no anything. We just relaxed there in nature and went for a walk. And it was great to be away from all that and something that's really important for all of us. But um, it takes getting away from it sometimes to realize how bombarded we are by these messages all the time and the thing is they internalize it they they present it in such a way that it's easy for us to internalize um in my hypnosis training years ago i learned that we take these messages and form these beliefs in two real ways one of them is through repetition over and over and over again and that's certainly what the media and the advertising does to us and the other involves a hooking of attention and delivery of a message. So in times like our childhood, for example, when emotions are running really high, we're excited about something, we're scared of something, we you know, maybe fail a test or make somebody angry, whatever the case is, emotions are running high. And in that message, in that moment, we hear some kind of negative message, we're that much more likely to internalize it. Our memory is imprinted that much more strongly when we're in those kind of situations. And so these stories start to control our lives. We never ask ourselves whether they're true. Most of the time, we don't even consciously think about it or remember back to these experiences, but that's why it's so important to... Uh, John gave a great description of 
feeling into the heart and working in the lower three chakras to experience it in your body and be there with the energy in order to really let it go. That's something that took me a long time to work with. Uh, I, being a five, tended to approach things much more cognitively, which is a very useful thing to do, but it has to be coupled with the rest of this because by itself, it's not enough. We have to approach this thing integrally from many levels and many perspectives. Um, one of the practices that I do is to become aware of these thoughts and then ask myself whether or not I think something is true. Of course, usually the answer is yes until I really start to examine it. First of all, I can see this negative belief about myself. I'm a, I'm a bad person. I'm a stupid person. I'm a failure, whatever it may be. I can see it, which means I am not that because there's something else looking in at that belief, right? So that's step one. Second is, am I sure it's true? Can I think of some examples of cases when that has not been true? And I can start to build up different references to change those beliefs. Now, having that kind of provides a little bit of crack in the wall that allows me to get in and do some of the heart-centered work and really change those beliefs at a deeper core kind of feeling level. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, I have talked a little bit in the past about my uh, training in Strasbourg method uh, when I was doing acting work. And my acting coach did all kinds of exercise with us that I didn't realize until much later were really brilliant psychological techniques um that's what they call method acting yeah 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 it's it's so fascinating i love this a type of method acting um mm -hmm. one of the questions that she asked us that has really resonated with me and it's a useful tool is is it possible and you can take that simple question is it possible and use it in all sorts of different ways can i change this belief is it possible is this horrible thing not true? Did I, did I interpret this incorrectly and it's been guiding my life in a bad direction? Is it possible that that's the case, that this thing isn't true? Can I change my life for the better? Is it possible? Could I write a new song today? Is it possible? Um, can I, <laughs> can, I, can I write a letter to the president to change his course of actions? Well, probably not, but is it possible? <laughs> can I not be a dickhead on the tennis court? Uh, you know, is it possible? Um, yeah, there's a, <laughs> John, I was thinking too that it's, your, your approach to that is just brilliant and you can look at it from a place of competition or you can, as, as you did, um, change your perspective to being grateful for having a partner that can provide that kind of growth and challenge to you. That was part of the, the glad you mentioned that was actually happening. I was, I was just being grateful for being there, being present and being able to play this wonderful game with a person I love who has, is really good, you know, that keeps me, you know, trying to get better. I've, uh, I've been slowly working through the book and I'm finally almost at the end now. Um, the tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. And it's, it's fascinating little snippets of interviews he did, with people and so much wisdom packed into, well, it's not a small book, but anyway, very condensed doses of wisdom. And uh, the section I read this morning, he talks about something he got from the uh, former Navy CEO, Jocko Willenick, who, who talks about this idea of good. Anytime anything happens, you say to yourself, good, and then find the reasons why. You failed your driver's test, well, good. Better to fail it on your test than fail it in front of a cop or, you know, get into an accident or something like that. Um, whatever it is, you say good and then ask what you can learn from it, what you can do differently. You know, you didn't get that job you wanted. Well, good. Now I can do other things or, or whatever the case may be. So it's a, another simple, powerful tool. Is it possible and good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are, are important tools because they start to think about it differently. You can start to change your stories just by asking those questions. You know, and also, the, you know, one of the things that I awake, of course, is, is, is creating these tools. Uh, most of them have been for deep inner exploration with, with um, 
the advent of stealing flow and some some earlier ones that we had along those lines of stealing flow, especially where you know we're working with just ramping the brain up so you can achieve flow states and your superpowers and, and your creativity and focus and you know uh, absorption of, of knowledge, etc. Uh, but but developing uh, a deep interiority, you know, we've been such a exteriorly focused a culture, you know, and we have people from all the world. So if you're not, you know, in the United States. We certainly have been. I think we influence the world in that way. You know, it's like get it done, achievement, eh, 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 you know, in an exterior way. And that's not bad. It's just completely not balanced. And the whole project will ultimately fail if you don't in, include interiority. So we need to know that in our, uh, in our work, we have to do just about balance, you know, for every inner, there's an outer, you know, and, and what is the exterior ramifications of this and what are the interior parts, you know? So even when you're going and working out in the gym, you know, you're, you're doing an interior aspect there, but the deeper we get into the interiority, the, the more, the more we're going to be, um, really actualize, you know, a human beings that can really uh, um, do excellent things and influence our cultures and our world and our times in ways that are extremely positive and good, you know, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. And, you know, I just, I was thinking about that today in my meditation, I probably should not have been thinking about it, but it was. And I was thinking about, you know, Trump, uh, President Trump and his family and all the things that are going on right now and how that you know, is this, is this the American dream? Is this what success is? You know, to be, you know, a narcissistic bully. That's a lot of glitzy hotels and lots of, you know, uh, trophy wives and lots of, you know, uh, of, you know, public affairs and, you know, and, and just, just, ah, is this what it means to be, is this what it's gone to? And I think if it is, it's because we've certainly neglected the interior growth you know, growing up and what that means to, to be a real man, to be an adult, to be a leader, to be a husband, to be a father, to be a human being. And uh, it, it's a real tragedy, but maybe uh, as your Navy, Navy SEAL friend was saying, maybe this is good. You know, maybe this is a time to deeply reflect, you know, how did this happen? And, you know, who has been neglected and what have we neglected among ourselves and what needs to be done to, to, uh, you know, Humpty Dumpty, man, bam, he's on the ground, he's all shattered, but maybe, you know, something's going to come out of that broken egg that's going to be uh, uh, something redeeming, redemptive, and victorious if we can, uh, if we can you know, ask why, you know, what, what is to learn, and okay, this is good, and, uh, and approach it from that way. But I'm, I'm very convinced that we have to, to really focus on, on deepening, you know, our soul work, our interiority, our psychological work, our spiritual work in order to, you know, be balanced on the inner and outer part so we can really get this thing into high gear and do some amazing things together. Um, so anyway, nice, Doug. Thank you. What a riff. Man. That was awesome. Um, any, any questions or comments from anybody uh, at this point? Yep. Uh, if you guys have questions or comments, you can feel free to uh, post them here in the chat box or you can uh, just turn on your microphone by clicking there in the lower left corner and share your questions with us that way. Just uh, remember that this will be published to YouTube when we're done. So if you don't want to be seen, don't uh, turn on your video. <laughs> okay. Um, John, any experience with light body meditation work? Light body meditation work. No. I mean, I, I, I really, when I do meditate, I become much more, um, I became aware early on that I was much more aware of my uh, uh, subtle body and uh, energies that I wasn't before. And I was doing uh, Qigong also when I kind of started this thing. That was really helpful. Subtle energy. But no, I'm really not. How about you, Doug? In uh I believe it's Tibetan Buddhism. There's something called cultivating the rainbow body. Is is that what you're referring to, or is this a different kind of specific thing? Um, is that when the body doesn't doesn't die it, it, or corrupted uh, upon death? It just like goes whoosh into light. I mean, I've read about stuff like that. I don't know if that's what the conversation. Is. I'm pulling it up. I'm sharing the link right now give me a second it's by two people that meditated for i don't know god knows how long and apparently all this information came to them 
it's super detailed and you follow, you know, step by step. My, my roommate, which is my life coach, which I think I mentioned to y'all before, um, started showing me this. She wanted to wait till she thought I was ready for it. And um, you do it one step at a time and you don't move on until you feel comfortable with each, each part. I'll, uh, I, I recognize this link because while I haven't explored too much, I'm actually, uh, I read, I read two books generally at a time, one that is more in the world and kind of personal development in an exterior level focused in the morning and then more spiritual stuff as the day wears on. But, uh, the evening book that I'm reading right now is from these same people, Oren and Dub N. Uh, no kidding. Yeah. So that's kind of an interesting synchronicity i suppose that you posted that um i do have some familiarity with light body work in that context though not through their program and their particular exercises uh, that you do um, can i teach this let's see it's a uh, very briefly there's a practice that i know of kind of working with the central channel or the secret channel of your body which is sort of related to the chakras, but you picture this column extending all the way up into the sky as far as you can, as far as you can down into the earth as well. And you alternate breaths, feeling the energy coming up from the earth into your central channel and you hold it there. The next breath, you bring it in from heaven above and you hold it there. The step after that, and then you just relax into the exhales. Once you're comfortable sensing the energy that way, you continue to work on your light body by uh, doing the same thing, but feeling it circulate within your body as you breathe into the exhales. Next, you kind of condition the energy by calling to mind a feeling of loving gratitude, complete acceptance, complete non-judgmental, perfect love, as much as you can recall that feeling hold that feeling in your heart space and then as you breathe the energy in from above and up from below and release it into your body the energy is then conditioned as it swirls around you and those things start to strengthen and build your light body um, i don't know if that's anything like the program that you linked here but that is a practice i learned that actually i have been doing again for the past uh, couple of weeks now and it's it's a pretty good one i definitely well what a, what a synchronicity um, you know, also, I would say that all of these kind of esoteric or any non-esoteric uh, spiritual practices, that if you're in a deep meditative state, they're going to work. But if you try to do it in your regular monkey mind and everything, it's going to seem really silly and not very effective. And so whatever practice you're doing, if you're using eye awake and going out of these deep, you know, theta, delta, epsilon, these different states, you know, you're down in a deep part of the ocean where these practices are actually becoming very effective. And if you're not, if you know, if you don't have a subtle mind and you da, 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 da. so whatever practice, you know, you're doing, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sufi work or Buddhist work or, or uh, esoteric or, or Jewish Kabbalah or, or, you know, centering prayer that was, comes from a Christian tradition, or any of these or none of them or something else, if you're in these deep uh, meditative states, that's really going to anchor it. And these are tools that were designed to be used at these deep levels. And when you start doing that, then they can really imprint in a very powerful way and be very transformational. It's for sure. The, um, where, where I'm at kind of is knowing all these tools and learning more about them and getting deeper into it and doing a daily practice of some sort. So if, if I'm not doing PMP one day, I'm doing the Louise Hay morning or evening meditation. So I'm doing these right things, but I ha I know there's something deeper that I'm, I have a lot of work to do on because I'm fucking up in, in other ways. Like I haven't done opiates in 40 days, but so what did I do after not feeling good on and off for 40 days? I took some Adderall and I felt better and it helped me with my physical pain that I've been to physical therapist since 2000 something before I even discovered opiates. So it's, it's trying to find this balance and, and, and retrain my mind that I can heal it without medication. And then I'm using benzos as needed for sleep or take the, the edge off. And I know that's, that's not where I want to be. I'm not going to say supposed to or should, but that's not where I want to be or where I can be. 
So I'm not beating myself up over it. I know it's just kind of like a little detour, but a lot of my closest friends and my, my mom, especially because moms are like psychic and, and she, she, she sees the change. But the ups and downs that I go through on a daily basis are, are, are insane. One, one half hour, I'm like the happiest dude. I'm like, oh, I'm never going to have a problem again. I'm sober. I'm clean. I meditate. I, I can help all my friends. I just, they can just share their problems with me. In the next half hour, man, like my, my coach is telling me to smile. I'm like, fuck you. I, why, like, I don't want to smile. It's fake. I don't feel that way. And so I, I want to learn how to get out of my feelings and get more grounded. And that, that's what I need to work on. And, and it's also being in a pattern of where all I did was, you know, wake up and use something. It wears off, use it again, use it again, use it again. Basically not even conscious or barely, barely eating. And when you did that for so long and um, that, it's like having to remember all these basic things, you know, brush your teeth every morning and night, eat food. If you're, if I'm on edge, just maybe cause I'm not eating enough, you know, I'm drinking lots of water, taking the supplements, exercise. It's all this basic stuff. It's a lot to remember sometimes in the moment, but I, I just wanted to share that the hardest part for me is um, the ups and downs and knowing that there's a slight conflict between where my heart is and where I know where I know I'm going to be. I don't know exactly how it's going to be, but I know I visualize it every day, but I know that I have to take baby steps at the same time and take it moment by moment. But I fuck up sometimes I do. And that's what I've been doing. So I'll take care of that in the next couple of days and go through maybe some uncomfortability again, but it won't be anything like I went through a month and a half ago. And, um, the, the, the statistics are, you know, it's, it's the truth. I don't know, 80, 90% of people that abuse opiates for so long, they, they come back. Eventually, they'll go back. But I, I don't care. I'm just, you know, I know the truth. And I know that I have the ability to work through anything. Well, definitely, and definitely get the support and the structure you need, okay? Because you have to really be ruthless with this darn disease you know because it's really hard like you said it would, it would you know 89 percent go back you know many times and if it was easy you know you wouldn't need all the you know everything we're doing treatment and, and all of this stuff so yeah uh good thing is to have some kind of support system um, you know built in when you start going to these downward spirals and eventually you know as you if you continue the meditation there's there's a spaciousness the, the witness so will will become more established but that's just nascent right now you know you just started that and the 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 habit of addiction has been something you've really been feeding for a long time so it's still very very powerful okay you know it's really there and so you have to really you know really work to transform yourself and get the support you need and of course benzos are you know are, are really affect the same part of the brain that that the that uh, opioids and they're super addictive they're just nasty as hell to get off of you get hooked on benzos it's really awful stuff again prescribed by doctors most of the time so yeah be careful that and i like your honesty but make sure you know you're not overconfident you get the kind of help and support that you need and if your life coach doesn't know a heck of a lot about you know recovery and and this stuff get get yourself a coach who does and you guys can work on a strategy together to uh to you know, to get you strong again. And, and uh, you know, there's this, there's, you know, when you're an addict, the addict self is the big deal and your real self, the healthy self is just really shrunken. And the process of, of recovery is to strengthen the good self and the addict self begins to lose its power to control you most of the time. But it's really, in the, especially in the early days, it's really, you know, it's, it's very dramatic uh, trying to, 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 to get through this thing. So. I just want to add one more thing. Um, it's also because of my career, you know, like I had a big gig Friday, Saturday, Sunday, taught yesterday morning, taught today morning, taught four students after the family class. So I'm working with people all the time and it's pouring my heart out, you know, performing and playing music. So I'm becoming more aware that I have that unconscious thing where, 
oh, I didn't play good enough, or I know I could play better, and that's not going to help at all. So getting that accepting part into my awareness on every gig. So it's like I've been playing my ass off lately. I've been having the greatest gigs recently, and people come up to me, and when I connect with people, that's the greatest thing. And then afterwards, it's like, Oh, okay, now I'm by myself again, you know, like I have nothing to show for what I just did. So I now I have to learn to appreciate, you know, moments they, just like, as they come and go. I, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but mm-hmm. today I teach a, a, this thing called um, Family Music Time, or it's called Music Together, developed in Princeton, and it's for babies to five-year-olds. So it's like a mommy and me class, but it's very structured, but it's very simple melodies and harmonies that kids will pick up and then they'll start singing when they get three or four. And we use instruments as well. So I did it and you know, all these kids were loving me. The hour went by, connected with all these families and then they're, they're gone. And I just got it back into place. And it's like, I'm back where I'm at, you know, like they don't know what, I was, uh, you know, what I'm dealing with, you know, and I'm happy in that moment. So I have to learn how to bring just like, not, not even happiness, but just just a, a non-dual, just existing sort of thing throughout the whole day. Yeah, equanimity when you, you move out the day and appreciate, you know, the, the moments of, you know, when you're doing brilliant teaching or doing brilliant performance, that's all good. And uh, learning how to do that sober is like, ah, you know, I mean, so many of the, of the greats that survived that didn't die uh, young, uh, learn, had to learn how to, to perform and be sober, you know, and, and of course most, uh, most like, uh, uh, Joe Walsh and Eric Clapton. I mean, there's so many stories of people who have finally got through it and have just, you know, come through better than ever and have so much wisdom and passion and goodness to translate to the music. But in the beginning, it's really hard. And, uh, yeah, those, those, those down things and those down things are 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 the danger points because that's when we um that's when we reach this you know just say screw it and 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 pick up and use again so you need to find the support and the mindfulness to go through those things and realize there's up and down states and to bless them all you know uh as, as uh i think who was it who said uh, then you'll be a man my friend you know the success and failure and you just have the equanimity to to witness it and experience it and let it be you know without it controlling it I feel like it, Kipling, it, by the way. it would be so great if I could just like tell everyone that I work with or teach or perform, Hey, I'm going through this. This is exactly what I'm going through. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's why he's being a dick or he's having a bad attitude or play playing like shit, you know, and the next day playing good, you know? So it, it's hard because I feel, I don't feel alone, but in those settings, you know, I feel almost, like bipolar or, you know, just a lot of shit going on. So I don't get it. I didn't get a break. You know, I, I'm, I don't want to say I used up all my chances with all the six different rehabs I went to, but I, I would like to, the, you know, the wilderness program you wrote about in your book, God, I'd love to get away from having to do anything and just be in nature for a couple of months, heal then reintegrate back into society. And I, and you, and you talk about how your chances for survival and, you know, <laughs> with not relapsing goes up with that. And so it's, I'm really fighting because I'm still in kind of the same thing, like same environment, um, going through a big change. So that's, what's also really difficult. Well, you know, I, I know I have all kinds of friends and contacts and colleagues that are doing the wilderness thing, which could be a, a good thing. Uh, let me know. Contact me if you want to talk about that more. We could talk offline, you know, okay. uh, about that. And uh, we also have Doug who uh, does coaching and Dr. Bob from, have you, have you been to the, uh, uh, our, our website, uh, our podcast? Yeah, I listen to like the first seven of them. Yeah, right? yeah. so, so the, the, they're both open to do that and sometimes you know it's not enough you just have to get away from your regular life and and uh, i think the wilderness is a great place to do uh powerful healing work so i have lots of contacts along those lines and uh do you have my email address 
Um, First, I can write it down if you yeah, answer it. Yeah. John Dupuy, you know, just like on all the all the propaganda, how the advertising, whatever, at, at gmail.com. Oh, that's simple. Got it. Yeah, so please, if you want to, you know, I mean, totally pro bono, if you just want to talk about this, we'll set up a Skype session and just, I'll make some recommendations and tell me what, you know, if we can support you in any way. Sounds good. And I can show you all the music knowledge I know. Oh, brother, I'd love it. <laughs> so thank you, man. You, thank you for bringing just earnest of seriousness and, and, and reality to this. I mean, not that we weren't doing that before, but I just appreciate your contribution. Is there anybody else who has any... Uh, any questions or comments before we wrap this thing? I was going to say, there you in, go. in particular, anything about um, working with our uh, false beliefs and changing those kind of things? Anything about uh, heart-centered meditation with uh, Call of the Heart? Or Yeah. and when, Call of the Heart, we're going to release this thing on um, uh, Thursday, I believe. Like tomorrow. My God, we're productive around here. We just keep that. We just it's so generative. There's such creativity. Anyway, the call the call of the heart are this music that Pam found. Is this music Pam found? It's like I don't know how many songs it is. Ten songs, quite a few, and they are were recorded a while back, a decade ago, by a, a woman in uh, I think she's Norwegian. Anyway, uh, she's Scandinavian, and there are a bunch of uh, Scandinavian ancient lullabies, you know, put to music, and she has a wonderful voice. It's very powerful. So Pam took this, and we we brought in uh, some of our 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 creative our creators here of this stuff, and they put in some some subtle energy connected it, along with the tracks and some isochronic stuff in there. And so not only you get the power of the beautiful music, but you're also getting this deep kind of meditative thing to take you really deep and the songs are like three or four minutes long and so you can listen to one they're very hard opening they're very beautiful and they really set you up i mean if you just have you know need to step away and take a break from work or something like that you could listen to one of those or kind of to open your heart when you go into meditation or you know just to to listen to as you go to sleep to really put you in a good you know a beautiful spot so i think you guys are really going to like them they're very special and uh, they'll be around they'll be tomorrow yeah, it's quickly become a favorite of mine for sure. I think there are a lot of others on the I Awake team who feel the same way. We've all been listening to it a lot. And and the the original stuff was troll music. We wanted the well, I wanted the because it's the, the the first lullaby is this ancient Scandinavian uh, lullaby where a troll mother has eleven baby trolls and she's wrapping her tail around her tail, something like that. It's this really gorgeous, beautiful um, a thing. That um, anyway, so. That those are the stories, and there I think some of the translations are becoming available because uh, 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 my sister-in-law Pam's uh, brother's married to a Swede, and she listened to it. Says, "Oh yeah, I heard all these things growing up." So the, in Scandinavia and Sweden, they know these these uh, melodies and these stories, these children's stories. Uh, well, okay, I guess it's about a wrap. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Stay tuned. We're going to try to get this into the podcast uh, world, you know. So, um, you know, great. But I still, we, I think we still need to keep doing it live because it is just, it ain't, it, without you guys, it's just not the same thing, you know. So, there, there's, there's, it really changes things positively. So, anyway, keep practicing. Keep um Keep going deep, you know, keep, keep, and, and keep developing your interiors and your exteriors and find that balance in your life and, and become a master of, of this integral cross training using all that we know and, and, uh, and the tools that we now have and, and just get better and better and, and, you know, be courageous and, and uh, you know, bless your failures or your so called failures and, you know, it's all good and get up and, and, and Keep going for all of us, okay? So thank you very much, and uh, love and respect you guys, and we'll be back, God willing, next week. Mm -hmm.